Hi everyone, I hope you're having a great week. Today I wanted to sit down and answer 10 questions that you have asked me. I ask for questions on Instagram. At the moment, I'm currently doing a small book tour, doing events over the next few months to talk about my latest book, which is The Girl Aquarium, which came out last month. So if you would like to come along to an event, I will leave details in the description box down below. You can see if I'm coming anywhere near you. And if I'm not, I thought that I would, well, do this video for those of you who can't attend so I can answer a few questions and talk a little bit about the book. I will leave links down below to where you can purchase The Girl Aquarium. It's published by Blood Axe. If you're in the UK, you can find it in your local bookshop. The Poetry Book Society is currently offering 10% off all purchases of The Girl Aquarium. So I'll leave a link to that in the description box down below if you'd like to grab one with a little bit of a discount. If you are a member of the Poetry Book Society, you get 25% off books anyway, um, which I've mentioned when I've done videos reviewing their seasonal selections before. So all links down below to events, to where you can purchase the collection. If you've already purchased it, thank you so much. It means a lot. Sending a book out into the world is a very scary thing, even though this is my eighth book. I still get scared. If writers say they're not scared, they're probably lying. So I have 10 questions that you have sent me about this book and I'm going to answer them. Let's get into it. Question number one is, what are the main themes of The Girl Aquarium? Okay, so themes that you would probably expect me to write about, bodily difference, disfigurement, queerness, girlhood, the sea, fairy tales and mythology, and all of those things thrown together and stirred around a little bit. Question number two is, why did you call this book The Girl Aquarium? So The Girl Aquarium is the name of one of the poems inside the book. And I obviously had to think about which poem I wanted to name the collection after. This poem sits snugly in the middle of the book and is a dystopian narrative poem about an aquarium that houses girls in tanks, different tanks, depending on how they look. It's about bodily difference. It is a way of discussing the freak show and science and also because it has that element of mythology, sea, girlhood, it kind of ties together all of the themes that I mentioned in the answer to the first question. So I thought it really embodied the collection as a whole. Previously, I had called it The Day We Ran Away From The Circus, which is the last poem in this collection. And I still have a soft spot for that title, but it is quite long. I'm not averse to long titles. My last book for Grown Ups was called The Beginning of the World in the Middle of the Night, but I decided to go for a shorter one this time. Question number three is how did you decide to package this collection and how did you decide on the formatting and the order? Okay, so the packaging I'm gonna to take to mean the cover. So the cover looks like this. And I had searched through so many different images before I found this one and sent it to Neil, who's my editor at Blood Axe and said I would really love to use this and he very kindly said that we could go for it. It's not often that authors have such an input in what their book is going to look like, but I absolutely fell in love with it because the quote I had picked at the beginning of this book is from Jeanette Winterson's Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit. I don't know how to answer, I know what I think, but words in the head are like voices underwater, they are distorted. As I mentioned, the last poem in the collection is called The Day We Ran Away From The Circus, and this is almost like he has escaped from the circus himself. And then this flamingo is peering down the elephant's trunk. Um, and that idea of observing, of looking, is very prominent within these poems, both with regard to the freak show, but also girls' bodies as they're growing up and how those bodies can be sexualized by other people before girls realize what their own bodies are. So it really seemed to fit everything that was inside. So I'm really glad that we went with this image. Inside the book itself, it's split, the poem's split into three different sections, which don't have names, but gather the poems together loosely. I spoke about this in a video where I was talking about my short story collection and ordering short stories for that. It's really difficult when you are trying to work out an order for something because the temptation is to group all the poems about one subject and put them all together. But I don't think that that lends itself to flow. So really what you're after is a wave-like movement throughout the book where the poems are connected to each other. And I did try to have mirroring images in the poems when they were side by side, but they don't feel too alike. So you don't feel as though you are not reading the same poem again and again because these poems are all different, but that you're not revisiting the same topic, topics in a short period of time. The only 
decision that I made to buck that trend for me was putting together poems that are in Geordie dialect, which I think is another question. In fact, it's the next question. I decided to put all of those together. There's only six of them. Um, so most of those are together apart from two rogue ones at the end. And the reason that I put those together is because I feel as though you can really get into a rhythm when you're reading dialect and it's helpful to have those, that one collective voice in one place. Question number four is, why did you decide to write some poems in dialect? So as I mentioned, about six or seven of these poems are written in a Geordie dialect. I'm a Geordie lass, I am from a village near the sea in the northeast of England. I just happen to have lost my accent somewhere along the way. But because I'm talking about girlhood, nostalgia, bodies, and a lot of memories to do with the sea, I find writing in the dialect that I spoke when I was younger really helpful. I was going to say cathartic. I'm not sure cathartic is the right word, but it's almost a vessel. It's a prism to tell these memory story hybrids through, almost like a secret language. And there is a lyricism to dialect in general that I find absolutely beautiful. So these poems that are in Geordie are written phonetically, but not wholly phonetically. So I didn't want them to be very confusing. I just wanted the odd word to Sing. So I'll quickly read one of those poems to you. This one is called The Angel of the North, which is about the Angel of the North, which is a statue in the northeast of England. I always wondered why a lass would stand on a hillside with her arms spread wide like she's reaching for the world, but there are newspaper chiefs what I take in a photo, with all of them chatting like she might have been theirs. So I stood on a bank, tilted in me back garden, and waited, impatient, for me skin a rust and fade. And it's weird, I keep saying. I didn't know if I like it, even though she's a sign what's to welcome us home. Cause if she cannot move, does it matter? And where are her eyes? And if her mouth cannot open, can she still taste the snow? What food does she eat? And what language should I use? And does she know she's a giant stretched out in the wind? If we take it in turns to stand face in the sky, will she know that we're there? Will she feel less alone? Question number five is, can you talk about humans and animals and how those play a part in your book? Um, there is a lot of animal, human, hybrid imagery throughout this collection. And that ties in with both freak show and with fairy tale, and also starts a conversation about where those two things intersect. I've spoken about this in my History of Fairy Tales video, which I'll link down below, but often disability and disfigurement were linked with bodily difference in fairy tales, and that would manifest itself in animal form. So there are lots of fairy tales where a husband or a bride is turned into an animal, and some of those may have been inspired by different medical conditions, such as Petrus Gonzalez, who is thought to have been one of the inspirations for Beauty and the Beast, who was born with hypertrichosis, which is where you're born with hair all over your body. Likewise, in the freak show, people were often named after animals. So I have a condition called EC syndrome, which is ectrodactyly, which is missing fingers. And there were people with ectrodactyly in freak shows who were called the lobster children. So I would have been the lobster girl had I been born a hundred years ago. And the mythology surrounding that was that maybe the woman who was pregnant with that baby ate too much shellfish when she was pregnant. Um, there was a woman called Madam Howard who had hair like a mane. People said that she was born that way because her mother had witnessed her father be eaten by a lion when she was pregnant. So there's a lot of that type of imagery within this book, both in the reflective sense, looking at the labels and names that were put on people without their consent, but then also a reclaiming and thinking about what animal you might like to embody to propel yourself forward. So there's one poem called Bird Lasses, which is about girls who are dressing up as birds and seeing if they can go out and fly in the world. So it's a mixture of different things. Question number six made me giggle. It's who is Caitlin? If you've already read this book, you might notice that there is a character called Caitlin who creeps up again and again, but doesn't necessarily seem to be the same person. She is, I'm not sure who she is. She could be an imaginary friend. I think she, <laughs> that makes me sound so young. She's a my imaginary friend. No, in poetic form. So she is the embodiment of certain ideas 
ideas that I would like to play around with. She is there to personify them, to give voice to them. Also, the name Caitlin means pure, and a lot of this collection is looking at queerness and bodily difference, and those things are often in society deemed impure, especially historically. So having that name, and again, reclaiming yourself to counteract that was very important to me. So Caitlin is ghost-like. I think she haunts these poems. She's a bit like a, a fairy darting between the pages. Question number seven was, can you tell us about your publication process? So poetry is a thing that I have written the longest. I have been writing it since I was teeny tiny, since I was about seven or eight. I had my first poem published when I was 11 and then went through a period of writing lots of emo poetry, some of which was maybe good, most I'm sure was terrible. And then in my late teens, early 20s, I started to submit individual poems to literary journals um, and was placed in some prizes, which was lovely. I collected together, I think about 20 poems and sent those to the Rialto who published a pamphlet of mine called the Hungry Ghost Festival. So normally when you're doing poetry, if you're going down the traditional route, you would try and place in literary journals and competitions. Then you try to place a pamphlet, which is a short collection and then after that you work towards your first full length collection which is what this is for me so my first book length collection so the hungry ghost festival was published in 2012 so between then and last year i was writing new poems to go in this book so i've been writing poems between my other books because i also write non-fiction children's books short stories um, and as i said this is my eighth book so i've been working on this one slowly for a long time and i feel very protective of it i think poetry is always very personal anyway but because it's taken such a long time um yeah it's been a little bit of a journey the poetry collection won an eric gregory award in 2016 parts of it won the jane martin poetry prize and then i started to send it out to publishers and blood Act said that they would like to publish which was lovely question number eight is are you scared to put yourself inside poems well t there are two sides to this. Inevitably, a poet is going to be in their work. One, because they wrote it, but two, poetry is very primal. Even though we think about craft and structure, and I love all of that, there's something about it that's very raw and personal. So yes, a poet's gonna be in there somewhere. It might not be that they're actually writing about themselves, but they bring all of their experiences and feelings to the table to write through whatever experience it is that they are discussing. I think ultimately every writer is writing to try and better understand themselves, even when they're writing about other people. But the funny thing is, in poetry, if especially if it's in the, written in the first person, many readers are gonna assume that it's about the writer, that it is the voice of the writer. So I try not to get worried about putting myself in poems because whatever I write, assumptions are gonna be made about the voice and its intention. So yeah, I think probably I worry more about putting other people in rather than myself. So I tend not to do that or at least disguise it really, really well. Question number nine is what is it about poetry that you love so much? Poetry is my one true love. Even though I write across so many genres and I love them all, poetry is the thing that I feel the most connection to, perhaps because it's the thing that I've written the longest, perhaps because it is something that I have been able to do slowly over time. I don't have big deadlines for poetry collections or individual poems. It's just not how poetry really works. So it is something that I can go back to when I want to time and time again. I'm sure that that plays a big part in why I love it. But it is the form and the craft that I adore so much. I love geeking out over this stuff. You know that if you've been subscribed to this channel for any length of time. I talk about poetry and dissecting it. I love to think about imagery and linking thoughts and patterns. And I love the things that you can do with a poem on a page that you can't do with prose, or at least it's difficult to do with prose. I love how you can use line breaks to insinuate things, create double meanings, make a reader pause in a place where they wouldn't otherwise, which would make them question what they're reading. I love how you can play with negative space. Um, I love how you can create silences. I have spoken about how I edit poems and think about structure. And I've also made a video where I've talked about how I craft poetry. So I'll link both of those videos videos in the description box down below where I talk more in depth in depth about why I just adore poetry so much. I also run poetry workshops which I'll link in the description box down below if that's something that you happen to be interested in. Question number 10 is can you read us a poem from the book and indeed I can. I'm going to read the second last poem from the collection which is called The Woman's Private Looking Glass. Instead of showing you my face as I read it I'm going to put the poem on the screen so that you can read along with it if you would like to. The Woman's Private Looking Glass Take the physician's advice 
Forget imagination and do not look straight at the moon. Up there, devil girls cradle silver eggs. They slide from roller coaster innards, trickle tales of the greats, Leda, Lilith, Sirin. All owl chested women, and do not peer into the sea. For there, salted tadpoles twist around your organs and turn your baby into stone. It is well known that climbing mountains breeds giants, forest beards and babes tossed into the woods. And it is understood that touching an animal seeps under your skin until every wild child resembles lions and lynx. What do they think of pulling concertina bands out of red raw wombs in a rooms reserved for the most complicated monsters? Let the gossips build the cage dragged to our city's centre stage. Let the world come. Let it pay a grand sum to gawp at all our animal children, the tiger-striped lass, the dog-faced lad, the hairy maid at the harpsichord, the horned girl, the Swedish giant, the lobster boy, the lobster girl, the pig-faced lady of Manchester Square, the man of the woods, the Victorian mummy, and isn't it funny how now we morph our fingers into keys? Magpied, glittering, picking locks to skitter out of all our silver boxes. Whether we are more or less bodied than the rule book states, I anticipate us diving into uncharted lakes, Babes, there's no going back now. Smash this circus to the ground. Howl fiercely at the moon. There you go. So those are the answers to 10 questions about the Girl Aquarium. If you haven't yet picked up this collection, it would mean, honestly, so much if you could. My heart and soul went into this book and it it would make me very happy. So I will leave links in the description box down below. As I said, the Poetry Book Society have 10% off. I also ship signed copies from my website. You can find it in UK bookshops. I will also leave a link down below to the Women's Prize because I recorded three poems, the audio of three poems for the Women's Prize for Fiction website. So if you would like to listen to more poems before deciding whether or not you think this collection is for you, you can head over there. I think that that is everything. If you have any other questions you would like to ask me about poetry, writing, whatever, leave them in the comments section down below. I hope you're having a great week and I will speak to you very soon. Lots of bookish love.